Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our first ever Voices of Leadership Studio Series. My name is Lynn Sprangers. I'm Vice President for Community Impact here at Mount Mary University, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. The Studio Series was created by our Women's Leadership Institute here at Mount Mary in support of its mission to inspire, educate, and support women as transformational leaders in service to their communities and in our world. We are fortunate to have some phenomenal women bringing their creative leadership stories to our campus. The Women's Leadership Institute is a place where we like to say potential becomes purpose. With that, I'd like to welcome one of our Mount Mary students, communication major Yvonne Samuel, who is going to introduce our special guest. I am very happy today to introduce to you our first leader for the studio series, Peggy Askenasi. Peggy is a native of New York and graduated from the State University of New York in Buffalo. Over her career, she has held various leadership positions at Frederick Atkins, Inc. and Sachs Incorporated. Since 2004, she has been with Kohl's Department Store, where she is currently the Senior Executive Vice President of Product Development. In this role, she is responsible for oversight of all product development, including product management, product services, private and exclusive brands, and the New York Design Office. In her tenure at Kohl's, Peggy has spearheaded many exclusive branding partnerships with such designers as Vera Wang, Jennifer Lopez, and the Food Network. In an industry that requires constant reinvention to stay in the game and relevant, Peggy has demonstrated that agility, imagination, and open-mindedness are traits that will take you far in your own leadership journey. This is Peggy Eskenazi. Peggy, um, let's step back a little bit as we look out at an audience of, uh, largely an audience of students. And I'm sure one of the areas that would be really um, inspirational and instructional as well for our students is talking a little bit about that part of your life where you began to think about career, school, and what was going to be, you know, what you were going to pursue in life. And one of the things that you have talked about is how that was informed by your own family. And in some cases, um, a lot of uh, hard work, and, and I think you've said even a work ethic that really kind of started you out very well in life. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your family and how that set you up in your career. Okay, be happy to. Um, I was actually pretty lucky growing up, and I, I'm not saying this is a formula for success, but I was lucky in that my mother, I was the youngest of four children, so I don't know if there are any other babies of the family here, but baby of the family means mom's favorite in my house. <laughs> so <laughs> I was lucky enough to be my mother's favorite. She thought I could do no wrong. I was brilliant. I was beautiful. Of course, I got into the real world and I found out the truth, but she kind of raised me to really believe in myself and she gave me a lot of confidence. Um, my dad, on the other hand, thought that my mother spoiled me terribly. And so he always held me accountable for things and he called me to task if I was being bratty or whiny or if I was being spoiled. And so I, as I said, I was very lucky in that I had this incredible balance between my parents and how they raised me. And um, my uh, mom was a stay-at-home mom. And uh, as a matter of fact, if she wasn't at the house when I got home from school at 3 o'clock, I was really angry with her. So things have changed. I was not home when my own children came from school. And um, my dad worked, and he was actually an apparel manufacturer. So um, the fact that I went into the retail business was, I don't want to say it was a birthright, but it was a very natural thing for me to go into um, the apparel business. Uh, in those days, we used to say it was the garment center in New York. So I grew up right outside of Manhattan. So my dad worked in the garment center, and I, when I graduated from college, had a psychology degree, which I decided I was not going to pursue, but I thought would be really helpful in dealing with the crazy people in the garment center. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I was lucky enough to, to get a job at Frederick Adkins, which you heard already, and I started as an assistant buyer there. Um, and the first day I went to work, um, my, my dad, who was not real big on um, advice giving, he was more of a, I would say he led by example, um, and he said to me, and you know, he knew a lot of buyers and he worked with all different kinds of people in the industry and he knew how it worked and, and what really were the pitfalls. And so he, the two pieces of advice he gave me were always be honest, and I share that with you, <laughs> because even if you think the truth is the worst possible thing in the world, there's nothing compared to a lie in terms of being the worst possible thing in the world. And um, the other thing he said to me was never take anything from anybody. And, and in fact, in those days, a lot of things did work like that. People would kind of pay off other people for orders and things like that. So he gave me this great piece of advice that allowed me to build a reputation over the years that I think serves me pretty well, has served me well, and, and serves Coles well because people think I'm honest and credible and I do what's right versus what I think may be the politic or, or personally more rewarding um, choice. We're so big on mentors at Mount Mary, especially since we're in a women's environment. Mm -hmm. We, it, we always have a village behind us, all of us who've gotten to where we are and those of us who are still on that path and, and, and as we change paths and course in life. Talk a little bit about, you mentioned your parents certainly being mentors, other people who influenced you along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have to say a mentor, to me anyway, doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in your field or somebody who is highly educated or you know has what you might think of as the attributes of a great mentor a great mentor for an individual is somebody who believes in them who gives them honest and fair advice and and you, you know I have a, a, a daughter who's actually in the same business that I'm in and I have another one who is in um, the entertainment industry, which I know nothing about. And I think that we, um, you know, still have a little bit of a mentor relationship because I believe in her and I give her advice that, um, you know, as much as a mother can is kind of untainted. Um, so your mentors can come from anywhere and could be um, people here at the school, people at your workplace, um, but it is a really good idea to find mentors for yourself, somebody who can, you know, help you make sure your head's screwed on straight, that you're thinking about things clearly. Uh, you know, there are times in any business, any, any field, uh, any university where you just have the most horrible days ever. And sometimes your, your judgment can get clouded by that. And so um, to have somebody to bounce ideas off of who just says, you know what, <laughs> take a breath, you're, you're overthinking it or, you know, you're not looking at this the right way is, is a, really, a really good and important thing. Wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about your work at Kohl's. Obviously, since it's based here in um, the Milwaukee area, we're all very familiar with, uh, with Kohl's products. And, and, and this has been, I know, a real um, signature of yours has been the brands, the exclusive brands. Mm -hmm. And we've got a video that we'd like to show because no doubt when you see it, you will recognize a number of these items. But this really speaks a lot to Peggy's work at Kohl's. So we're gonna take a look at the video and then we'll continue the questioning.
excellent. Is Jennifer Lopez as gorgeous in person as she is on the screen? I have to ask that. She is. <laughs> she is. I, I um, um, go to her house from time to time, and, and we work on product lines with her, so I bring our designers out, and I usually sit and watch everybody do what they have to do. But one time we got there, and she was sick, and they said, well, you're going to have to go up into Jennifer's bedroom and work in her bedroom. <laughs> so we all trudge up there with all the bags and everything, and unpacking the bags. And so she's sitting on the bed with her feet out straight, and she's sitting up, no makeup at all, and she's stunning. She's stunning. And you know, they, um, people have said that she has kind of a glow. She does. Mm -hmm. she, she literally, her skin glows. It's magnificent. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us because we, I think we, we, we see her and she always looks fantastic. So. She's amazing. But you know, I would say too, she works really hard. I mean, we've, we've met with her when she's on tour. And, um, you know, so she's got to steal a couple of hours and sit down with us. And, you know, we kind of make her work hard. I mean, she, it's not physically hard, but it's a lot of stuff that we have to get done in a short amount of time. And then, so, so she'll just have done a tour, sh her show at night. You know, she gets up. She's got to deal with us. <laughs> we leave. They drag her to the gym where she's got to go work out like crazy to, to continue to look as stunning as she does. And then she goes and does another show. Oh, and she also spends time with her kids in between, who she's very devoted to. So she's, yeah, she works really hard. Well, thanks for providing us with a little slice of how these relationships were cemented. This is something you talk about. This is a, 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 a real pride of yours in terms of your work at Kohl's. And I think it's great for our students to learn how that thought process came together, that big idea that these were people that we're going to help Kohl's in the bottom line yeah. um, in, in, in becoming, you know, always freshening up the product and finding ways to appeal to the consumer. Share a little bit about that, that idea that went into this. Mm -hmm. So when I joined Kohl's, it was nine years ago, and um, you would have known us at that point in time as pretty much a commodities retailer. We had very basic product. Um, uh, our, our mentality, our approach to product was very Midwestern, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but doesn't necessarily play in Southern California or New York or Southern Florida. So it was very clear that we needed to make some changes because we were opening massive amounts of stores all over the country. So we went from being a Midwestern company to a national retailer on a really big scale. So we had this business that was our private brand business, and it represented about 25% of sales. And it was, you know, really kind of like a dirty little secret for the company. We didn't, we didn't really talk about it too much. We didn't like it that much. We just used it to drive promotions and promote at really, really aggressive price points and sell lots and lots of basics, which in the Midwest was a tremendous formula. And so it became clear that we needed to um, do something that was going to be newer and more relevant um, so that we could broaden our appeal to more types of customers across the country. And so we developed what we called at the time a nine box grid. And it was three boxes across the top, three boxes down the side. And we set it up by price point, so good, better, best. And we set it up by um, the other, on the other axis was um, classic, modern, classic, and contemporary. And so we put our entire resource structure onto that grid, and we realized that the whole contemporary and better and best price points was a complete void. It was an absolute white space for us. So we said, well, if we want to appeal to a broader range of customers, we need to broaden the types of product lines that we order uh, offer. So. Um, so that's when we started to think about this exclusive brand strategy. And it didn't really make sense to continue to make up names, which is really how the private brands were developed many years ago, a lot of them in, in the early 90s even. So they're, they've been around for a long time. Um, so the thought was, well, you know what? We can create exclusive brands. And because of our scale, we can make them exclusive national brands. We're national. So we started to develop these conversations. The, the idea that we might bring Vera Wang to Kohl's at the time was kind of outrageous. And um, you know, she was at the very high end of the market. 
um, her best friends were Anna Wintour and Ralph Lauren, and here we are talking to her about this idea that she could bring her aesthetic, her design, to many millions of women, tens of millions of women across the entire country. So this idea really appealed to her, but on the other hand, she was very nervous about what that would do to her reputation, to her business um, at the luxury collection and bridal levels. And so, you know, a lot of trepidation for her. And it actually took her one year of cajoling and, you know, kind of negotiating to even get her to the point where she said, okay, yes, I want to do this. So we finally put the deal together. We put together a team who is strictly responsible for working on Vera Wang designs. We do um, women's apparel, handbags, footwear, jewelry, bedding, towels, um, just about anything um, pretty much that you'd find. We do tights, we do leggings, all, all these great products. And so we positioned her as contemporary best, so she's the best price point and she's the most fashion forward of the product lines that we we offer. And so she was kind of like the turning point for us. Once we created that deal and word got out in the market that this was going to be an exclusive Kohl's brand, other things really started to happen because people think, well, if Vera did that, heck, <laughs> we should do that. Um, so um, uh, we were able to bring several other brands, and you saw a lot of them on the screen after that. It was kind of a cascade. So over the next several years, we continued to launch these brands, and they became these really tremendous efforts at Kohl's on the part of a lot of people. So it wasn't just the design and product people, but the merchandise presentation people created entirely new in-store experiences for each of these brands so that we created shops. I mean, this was kind of blasphemous at Kohl's. We didn't do those kinds of things. We were very democratic. Um, and. Um, uh, so as you come into the store and you see all these different brands, you would have kind of like a shop within a shop. Our marketing people really got behind these brands in a huge way, and they created a whole Only at Kohl's campaign, which you would have seen for several years, um, uh, talking about these brands. And so the idea is that these brands become destination brands, and the customer selects Kohl's as her destination of choice because we have these very desirable brands. So the strategy really worked for us. It was the big growth engine of the business. Um, we actually wound up between our private brands, which you remember were 25 percent of total sales, and the exclusive brands grew to over 50 percent of total company sales. So it's been a tremendous um, success story and uh, a, a fantastic strategy for us. And now we're actually in a place where our strategy is evolving again. So, so that's the thing, you know, a strategy is, is great. You must have a strategy. And even more important than having a strategy is having great execution. But you can't think that your strategy is going to last in perpetuity things change. And so you, you, know, you have to constantly look at your strategy and make sure that you're relevant, that, that you're putting your customer first and understanding what her needs and wants are or his needs and wants are and that you build strategy around that. So you build strategy and we do this around the feedback that we get from our customers, which is really helpful because if you listen to your customer, you put your customer first, you really, you can't go wrong. Good point. And, and it's a brutal industry. I mean, when you think about retail, we, there are plenty of, um, the, I should say the landscape is littered with plenty of retailers who are no longer, right? So you're, you've got to always got, figure out what that next idea is going to be, that next hot something. Um, and, and, and as you said, listening to your customers often will get you there. Let's talk a little bit about what is next. And there's a, an exciting initiative that Kohl's is involved in right now. And Peggy, again, on the front line of that, is going to give us a little... Uh, a little insider uh, information on what is emerging at Kohl's and sort of its next evolution. And it's really going to focus on beauty, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. So um, we, we actually have a few huge strategies in place that, um, or I should say probably initiatives, um, that we think are going to drive comparable store increases, but also keep us at the forefront of our customers' minds in terms of relevance. Um, so beauty is an area that Kohl's really has not played effectively in ever. Um, several, many years ago before I got there, 
um, the company formed a partnership with the Estee Lauder company to create brands, not the Estee Lauder brand or Clinique or any of the other great brands that they own, but to create these new brands. So their names um, are brands like American Beauty and Flirt. Has anybody ever heard of these? Really? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but for the most part, people didn't know what those brands were, what they represented. And so, in fact, over a several year period, um, they never grew, it never became a meaningful portion of the company's business. And so a couple of years ago, um, I actually went to our CEO and I begged him <laughs> to let me have the beauty business and to see if we couldn't do something with it. So I think out of desperation and just aggravation with me bugging him about it, he said, <laughs> go ahead. And so um, then they, they allowed me to bring in um, some outside consultants who very definitely said beauty is a huge opportunity. You're basically walking your customer elsewhere for her beauty needs when she would be just as happy and maybe more happy to buy her beauty at Kohl's. So um, we also did some research with our customers to understand what the positioning should be. Are our customers what they call mass, what you would buy in Walgreens as an example, or our, are our customers prestige beauty customers? Do they shop in department stores for beauty or Sephora for beauty, which is where you'd find the prestige brands? And um, it turns out that our, our most, um, um, most valued, we call them most valued customer or our most loyal customers were prestige beauty customers. And so we started to develop a strategy to develop that business. And you know, you can't go knock on Clinique's door and expect them to sell you at any point in the foreseeable future, maybe not even in my lifetime. Um, we have a divisional who works for us now in beauty, and he worked at Ulta before, and he said it took him six years of banging on Clinique's door to get one Ulta store. And now Ulta is rolling out Clinique to all stores. So this, is, uh, this has got to be over a 10 or 12 year period that this is happening. So I, I just want to give you a sense of, of bringing um, beauty brands into the store. It was a big, um, big lifting effort on the part of our beauty team. So, so we built the beauty team, we brought in some experts, some people who had been at other companies um, uh, in the beauty business, and um, we started to renovate some of our stores. So in the fall of this year, more toward the fourth quarter, we opened 280 stores with a new beauty experience. Well, they were, the, the stores were opened already, but we created a new beauty experience in those stores. So we did these great renovations. We hired and trained um, beauty associates who could actually help our customers, who could um, make them up, who can um, do all kinds of um, advisory things for them in the areas of beauty. And um, we brought in 30 new brands that the company did not previously have. So brands like Lorac and Cargo, H2O Plus, The Balm, Essie, um, EOS, uh, and a number of others. And um, anyway, the, the, um, this has been a very successful venture for us so far. The beauty department's running ahead about 40 to 45 percent in the stores that we renovated and we have the new brands in. And the total store where we have the new beauty environment is also generating um, better sales comps, comparable sales um, than the stores without beauty. So that's really what we needed to do was elevate the entire store performance by bringing this new beauty department in. So um, we had our sales call today, Kevin Mansell, our, our chairman and CEO, and talked a lot about beauty this morning and how successful it is. And we're going to add another 200 stores. So by the end of this year, we'll have 500 beauty stores. And in another couple of years, we'll have beauty spread to the entire chain. So we'll be adding more resources and um, uh, lots more to come, but very exciting for us as a company. And as you heard Peggy say, six years in the making as far as, you know, as, as seeing the fruits of your labor. Uh, well, well, actually two years, <laughs> two years so in. far, but we are, um, we're very early in on this whole venture. Yeah. It's gonna take us many years and um, uh, we're happy with where we are now. 
Um, but of course we recognize that we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And the idea is, as you said, to get people to spend more time in the stores. The beauty line will hopefully mean that people can spend more time and it seems to have already have had some payoff. Yes, absolutely. Great. Great. Yeah. Um, what I want to do is, is um, thank Peggy for this portion of our studio series, but don't go anywhere because we have more for you. This is uh, what we will now move into is what we call our um, sort of Mount Mary signature questions. Okay. If you're familiar with the um, Inside the Actors Studio, though we promise to keep it clean, um, there are usually some questions at the end of the person who is being interviewed, oftentimes uh, Hollywood folks and, and, and other prominent people like Peggy. And what we wanted to do was come up with our own Mount Mary version of this. So we turned to our brain trust here, our students, and they came up with what uh, they believe are great questions. The students from our Women's Leadership Institute Student Advocates Group and from our uh, communication for mass media. They're fun questions and uh, we think they may offer a unique glimpse into Peggy, things you haven't already heard or learned from her. We hope we'll learn from some of these questions. And these are the questions our students asked. We'll ask these of all of our visitors to our studio series. Peggy, describe your life using only a song title. <laughs> okay, so lucky for me I had this question in advance <laughs> because there would not be a good answer otherwise. My answer, if I didn't hear this question in advance, would have been a song called Brown Eyed Girl, which is a Van Morrison song, and that I just have brown eyes, so the, that was the reason behind that. But um, because I knew about the question, I, th I really thought, and I sent notes to my daughters, and I said, what do you think should be you know, the song title of my life? And, and they, didn't, they came back with nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they did not help their mother. So this is what I did. So I Googled um, song best <laughs> because I feel like I, I have a lot of best in my life, and I'm a very fortunate woman. So the song that I came up with was Best of Both Worlds, which is a Van Halen song. And the reason why I picked that was because I'm lucky enough to have the, the best in, or for me, what is the best? It wouldn't be the best for everybody. In terms of my career, I managed to find myself in a business that was kind of, in, in a lot of ways, second nature to me and something that I loved and, and happened to be pretty good at and over the years developed a lot of skills in. So I, I got the best professionally and I worked for a great company and I get to work with a lot of great people and I've um, helped to build a, a fantastic and talented team. And then I have also, and this is no criticism of anybody here, but I have the best two daughters <laughs> that a mom could have. And again, they're the best for me, but um, they're pretty amazing. And we've actually reached the point in our lives where we've traded roles and um, they give me advice all the time. Um, but I have the best professionally and I have the best personally. I also have a granddaughter who's going to be three soon and that's, a whole nother level of bliss, so maybe I, maybe I have to elevate the title next time we meet. We'll invite you back for that. <laughs> what is your biggest pet peeve? Uh, so, um, yeah, this is a very interesting question. You know, um, I think, first of all, I'm, I don't know if you can tell this, but I'm usually a really calm person. People typically at work will say to me, you're so calm, why are you so calm? And I think part of that is, um, uh, the years give you some perspective and you know you go through things that sometimes seem so disastrous and just so beyond any any way to make them right and you know what at the end of the day you live the company survives and you manage to move forward so over many years of this you gain some perspective and um, so I would say small things don't typically bother me. I, I had a, a young woman come into my office and it's not, it's not unusual for somebody to come into my office and cry. It's <laughs> a little bit of a regular occurrence. It's not that I make them cry, but they come in to confess something or to you know, worry about something. And so this young woman came into my office and she was just devastated over something that she did that was a mistake. In the scheme of the world, it was 
you know, like this. But to her, at that particular moment, she was absolutely devastated, and she was just bawling her eyes out. And I said to her, calm down. <laughs> this is tomorrow. It will be better. This, if, I told her, if this is the worst thing you ever do in your career, you will be a really lucky woman. And so perspective is a really important thing to have. And it's not that you don't want to take serious things seriously. I do, and you know, you must. Um, but you don't want to get crazy about things. You want to solve them, fix them, figure out how to do it better next time. So in terms of pet peeve, I don't know if I have one. But the thing that I dislike the most of all is um, untruthfulness. So that, that would that would bother me, uh, but not at, you know, like a peeve is like, you know, a little something scratching at you, but um, I, I don't really have those things. As you dial back to your college days, what is the most unique class that you've taken? And maybe it's something that you went back and took after, after leaving school, but what was the most unique class? Um, hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know that I took anything that was so unique, but I'll tell you what was the most useful. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> they don't even offer it anymore. Um, but well, arithmetic. But you know that I'll leave that out. <laughs> arithmetic. <laughs> um, but it was typing. <laughs> because I mean, today you say keyboarding, right? So um, when I was in high school, we had typing classes because the assumption was most of the girls graduating high school would have some sort of job where you needed to type, right? You're, you're nodding, you know. Nodding. You needed to type because you were going to be somebody's assistant or secretary or you know, something along those lines. So anyway, so you, know, you kind of took typing. But as it turns out, you spend so much, life, so much of your life today in front of a keyboard or on a device where you need to quickly communicate with your fingers versus any other means. Um, so, so it, you know, crazy enough, I mean, that turns out to be the thing that I use most often in my career, in my life, of anything that I studied when I was in college or high school or anywhere. Isn't that funny? I, somebody taught me how to gift wrap because I worked in br the bridal registry department, and I'm a, I'm a really good gift wrapper to this day. <laughs> so you always look at those jobs and you say, that's the one thing you carry with you, so I'm glad you shared that. What is the most non-essential item? you tend to always carry with you? Oh, um, well, there's a few. If you lifted my handbag, you would know there are not a lot of, there are a lot of unessential items in there. Um, so um, I always have my passport with me, which most days is not really necessary, but I'm always ready to go somewhere if I need to. Um, and I, I always carry, um, uh, static guard with me. <laughs> There's a pet peeve. <laughs> Staticky clothing is a pet peeve. Um, so those are probably two things that are y usually in my bag, but um, I seldom use them. But it, I use the passport because I do travel, but you know. You know where to find it. You always know where to find if it. I, my thought is if I put it away in a drawer, the day I'm headed out to the airport to make that trip, I will forget it. So I just keep it all the time. Makes sense. And our last question from our students is, what profession, other than your own, would you most love to do? I would probably um, want to do something with um, interior design, which I, th I think so many, so many people are interested in today. And I mean, you see, you look at magazine stands, you see the number of shelter magazines, and House and Pinterest and all these other sites where you can vicariously um, study other people's homes and rooms and, and build your own. So um, I, I'm also really fascinated by that, and um, I, I love to, to do that. So when I live somewhere and, and I get all finished, I'm ready to move somewhere else pretty much. Well, and we can sign you up right after we wrap up the studio series today. Our, I, our interior design people are probably in and around, so we, we can help you set on that next career when you're ready to do that. Sounds good. Thank you, Peggy. Now what we want to do is, is open up the floor to you, our wonderful studio audience. And um, what we do have is a microphone that is set up, and because we are recording this, please be sure that you use the microphone. And if you'd like to identify yourself to Peggy, uh, your name and your major, that would be terrific. So what we're going to do is ask uh, the first person who would like to uh, step up to the microphone. Um, 
Oh, who would like to go first? What brave, there you go. All right, thank you, Katie. Hi, Peggy. My name is Katie. I'm a public relations student here at Mount Mary. And my question for you is, as a woman in an executive level position, were there challenges you faced to reach that executive level that is usually dominated by men? Um, I, I would say that, um, in general, um, our field is friendlier to women than many others. Um, so I think I probably had less of a headwind than I might had I chosen some other career. Um, uh, you could definitely see, even in retail, which is so much about women, the ultimate consumer is 80% female. You could see at the low ranks of our company or any company that it's highly dominated by women. The number of men is uh, in ratio to women is, is much smaller. But the higher up you go in the ranks, the more men relative to women there would be. Um, so, um, uh, you know, in some ways it, it could work out to be an advantage. And the reason why I found it to be an advantage, especially when I got to Kohl's, was because there were so many men and they don't have the intuitive understanding of the customer or what she would want or why something is practical or what makes sense to her um, that, that we have. And um, so, so I always felt it was kind of a leg up. And then in terms of advancing um, my career relative to being a woman, um, I think, I think there was a lot of you know, luck, right place, right time involved, as there is for everybody. Um, but also a lot of hard work and being prepared and, and putting the numbers on the board when you need to. Um, but I, you know, I think I, I also had luck play a hand. And uh, uh, I never felt too much like I was disadvantaged for being a a woman. As a matter of fact, when I got to the executive office, I felt like we had a, an all-male executive office and we needed a woman. So in that case, <laughs> I was the, the beneficiary of that. Um, so it worked to my particular advantage. But as a, a sex, there, there's still you know some inequities when you get to the top. I think fewer. Next question. Um, my question for Peggy is, what skills stand out the most to you that you needed in that kind of position of being in power? Um, I don't view myself as being in a position of power, but I like when you say that. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, I would view it as a, a position of leadership, and so um, uh, with that, I think, comes a lot of responsibility. and. Um, you know, some, some people in leadership roles think their people are accountable to them to deliver results or to produce or whatever. Um, but I think a leader is at least equally accountable to their people to provide the vision, to help them get the tools that they need to do the job, to make sure that they're helping their people overcome obstacles and, you know, kind of to support their well-being aside from um, all of that. And so um, I, I think that's a really important role of um, being in a leadership position. Um, and I think you asked me what skills. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, at Kohl's, when, when, when I interview people for management positions, they ask me, well, you know, what are you looking for? And the first thing I always say is we're looking for leaders. We're looking for people who understand how to lead a team. And it's not about telling people what to do. It's about, it's about building a team and helping them achieve the best possible results. So the leader does not have the responsibility of having all the great ideas. No one person can have all the great ideas. But it's about bringing your team together to develop those great ideas and then to develop and execute the plans for those ideas and to make them big business 
um, uh, returns for the company. You need to develop skills along the way. You need to have the business skills, regardless of what business you're going to go into. So, um, you know, certainly in, in my case, because I do product development and I actually came up through the product development organization, so I learned a lot about fabric. I learned a lot about construction, garment construction, how things are made. I learned a lot about doing business in foreign countries. I learned a lot about duties and tariffs and how things get costed and what different fabrics cost um, in relationship to one another and how do you build a better garment versus a less expensive garment. So all of these kinds of things were job skills that I needed to learn um, in order to do the job along the way. And then those things became less critical for me to know at an infinitesimal level um, as I moved up the food chain. But it was really helpful that I did know that stuff because I could help our people as they were learning and as they were trying to make the best decisions for the business. Okay. Thank you so much for the insight. Thank you. Barbara. Was it because I said I like interior design that you <laughs> Yes, that's why. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Barbara Armstrong, the Dean of the School of Arts and Design. And my question to you is, when you've had one of those flubs, as you talked about somebody coming in your office, um, you know, we all experience them. I could tell you stories as well. <laughs> what would you say is the best way to recover from failure and learn from it? Mm, well, actually, I, I think you answered your question when you said learn from it. So. Um, uh, you know, it, failure is bound to happen. And if you're going to, I mean, this is kind of cliche at this point, but if you're going to achieve greatness or strive to achieve greatness, you have to accept the fact that you're going to fail sometime. And if you only position yourself for success, you're going to miss a lot. So, um, so the idea with failure is to fail fast. Don't prolong your failure. <laughs> Cut it off quick. <laughs> and you know, take your losses, but learn your lessons, and then you move on. So I would say fail fast is, is probably the thing I would um, recommend to everybody. You know, be honest with yourself. If you're, if you're failing at something, or you know, it's a particular thing that's not working, get a new strategy, <laughs> get a new idea, and learn what you did wrong. I mean, that's really important, too, because you, you probably have done this already. You learn more. You remember situations more where you failed or where you, you know, some, somebody told you no rather than all the, the happy, good stuff that went on. So the, the failures are important. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rebecca Callis. I'm a communication major. Um, I know that my biggest fear would be um, to fail, but what is your biggest fear? What is my biggest fear? That's a really good question. Um, um, I don't know. You know, I feel like um, I'm responsible for the professional success and the well-being of a lot of people. So I think my biggest fear would be for our team to feel um, inadequate or underinformed or um, unprepared to do what we need them to do. Um, that would probably be the worst thing, to look into your people's eyes and have them be in a state of panic when you're talking to them about something that you know you need to get done or, or some direction that you're going in and that you can see they're just not equipped to deal with it or to do it. So that would be a really, really scary place to find myself in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sandy Kaiser, um, I use your nine box grid quite a bit in classes. And Great. I've also read that Kevin Mansell is saying that 50% of private or exclusive brand is just about enough for, for the coal strategy. So mm -hmm. what's next, um, aside from beauty, if uh, you want to maintain that 50-50 balance between wholesale brands and private brands? Mm -hmm. um, 
so, you know, I said you have to reinvent your strategy. And so we, we have found ourselves in the last couple of years at that crossroads. And um, uh, so we actually putting more emphasis now on national brands, new national brands. So the company had the exact same stable of national brands for at least as long as I've been at Kohl's for nine years without a lot of freshness, new brands, or even really us pushing the national brands to bring newness and innovation to us. A lot of times we buy and they think we want to buy the most basic, the most mundane of their assortments, which is just is not not going to cut it anymore. Um, so we've challenged our national brands to bring us a lot more newness and innovation and to grow brands in areas like active where, um, uh, where um, you know, that business is really thriving right now. It's growing at an amazingly accelerated pace. And uh, so, you know, we talked to Nike, do a lot more Nike business. And we talked to other resources in that space who have national brand presence, highly desirable brands to grow that business. Um, and then we're talking to other national brands in other parts of our business um, because we do think that we need to reset the balance. Um, customers come out, do come out for national brands and um, they come out for our exclusive brands too, but national brands have the most awareness um, and if we can offer them in a Kohl's type of way, then we generally win as long as we have the best brands and um, the best assortment of those brands. So we're rebalancing the scales between our own internal brands and the national brands and you may even see the um, uh, national brands um, exceed 50% again. But in the meantime, we're going to make sure that we're tightening up our private and exclusive brands and that we're um, well editing our assortments, that they're delivering more gross margins, so more profit to the bottom line. Um, than they have been, and they already deliver the best profitability, but we can do better. Um, if we edit intelligently, we're driving harder on items, we're sourcing more intelligently, getting better costing for better quality. Um, so all of those things are, are very, very big priorities for the whole product development organization. And, um, you know, even though you would say, well, um, I, I mean, the idea really would be to keep private and exclusive brands where they are, which is um, over a $9 billion business, and then grow the national branded side of our business. So we don't want to lose on the exclusive and private side. We just want to grow on the national side. So that's, that's the goal. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. And Shioma, I think you're going to help round out our questioning. Okay. Hi. Hi. It's really nice to meet you. And thanks to the Women's Leadership Institute. I wanted to ask you, we have students here, and we're always glad when we have a leader such as you. What would be your advice for our students in terms of how do they prepare themselves to be someone like you? What should they be doing right now? Any kind of classes they should be taking, or internships, or extracurricular activities? What should they be doing right now to prepare themselves for? the leadership roles? It's a good question, and you touched yeah. a little bit earlier on hiring people and some of the qualities that you look for. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, you know, I would say that I think the, the best advice I can give anybody who's entering the workforce is to, um, to go in with the mindset that you're going to work hard, that you really want to learn, and that you're going to be professionally curious and that you're going to be willing to spend the time and that you're going to be mindful, meaning uh, very aware of your surroundings and what's going on and what's happening beyond just the scope of your job. Somebody once told me you should look and act like the position you want, not the position you have. And that, that turned out to be pretty good advice. I mean, it's, it's fairly fundamental, but, um, uh, you know, don't, don't just think about what you're doing. Think about the bigger, the greater good of the company or, or whatever enterprise you're working in and how you can contribute and try to get an understanding beyond the scope of what you do. Um, I know people, particularly young people, have a lot of demands on their time today and, um, uh, you know, we talk about millennials at Kohl's and how do we inspire our millennial 
associates to, to be committed and to work hard and to want to spend the hours that are needed. And, and there really has been a very big shift in how people look. I, I think it's because um, millennials, younger people entering the workforce today saw their moms and dads who were the baby boomer generation killing themselves and missing soccer games and school plays. And you say to yourself, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't make that much sense to me. So you have to decide what your priorities are. And um, if, if your goal is executive leadership, then you're going to have to put in the hours. And, and, you know, not everybody wants to be an executive and not everybody should be. Um, gearing for that type of role. So be honest with yourself about what it is you really want to accomplish, what your priorities are in life. How do you want to see yourself in 10 and 20 years from now? And then spend your time on that. Do that, whatever that is. And you know, a lot of you are, are young to even think about, much less know where you want to be. But you know, it's good to start to to formulate those thoughts and, and develop your life priorities. Um, but you know, if your life priority is being a, um, an executive at, at a major corporation and you're not putting in the hours or the hard work, then you have to really ask yourself if that's a realistic goal. And if your goal is to be the best mother in the entire universe, then don't spend 12 hours a day at your job. So that's, that's what you got to think about. It's about balance and, and priorities. And, and I think, as you said, Peggy, in spite of all of the uh, efficiencies of technology, there's still no substitute for hard work in whatever profession we choose. I want to thank all of you for being here today, our, our inaugural um, studio series. And I also want to say thank you to the Women's Leadership Institute student advocates who were important organizers of this event. And, um, but mostly what we want to do is thank Peggy Eskenazi for sharing her story with us. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for being a great audience. Thank you once again to everybody. Thank you to Peggy and have a great day. <laughs>